The magical properties of the rod of God extended beyond the physical power to create and destroy. The staff gave its bearer, Moses or Aaron, the gift of prophecy. This power is implied in the Old Testament, but is more explicit in modern revelation. But before we can delve into the magic of the rod, we must first explain an important aspect of the kingdom of God on earth, the callings of first and second elder. In a revelation to Joseph Smith, currently section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord named Joseph Smith as the first elder of the church and Oliver Cowdery as the second elder of the church. These were not temporary honorifics, but permanent callings, independent of other assignments in the First Presidency or elsewhere. Joseph and Oliver were designated as first and second elders almost from the beginning of the Restoration. When they received the Aaronic priesthood from the hand of John the Baptist, they were promised that when they received the High Priesthood from Peter, James, and John, they would also become the first and second elders of the church. The first and second elders have specific roles and gifts. They are to serve in the kingdom as Moses and Aaron respectively. Joseph as Moses was appointed to receive the commandments and revelations from Jesus Christ. Oliver as Aaron was a spokesman, appointed to declare the commandments and revelations that Joseph had received unto the church. Oliver was ordained to this position in December 1834. Joseph Smith officially designated the position of second elder as assistant president of the High and Holy Priesthood of the Latter-day Saints. Since the callings were new to the church, Joseph explained them to those present. The office of the president of the church presided as did Moses over the nation of Israel. Neither the revelations or the histories record when Joseph was ordained to this calling, but it likely happened at the visit of Peter, James, and John, as promised by John the Baptist. The visit occurred at least four years earlier according to a revelation given to the prophet in August 1830. The second elder, or assistant president, was to act as Aaron did in support of Moses. Both president and assistant president held the keys of the kingdom. The relationship and roles of prophet and spokesman were given by the Lord to Moses and Aaron when Moses claimed slowness of speech. The rod was part of the arrangement. 
It is this relationship, as articulated by the Lord and then carried out throughout the Exodus, which Latter-day First and Second Elders were commanded to follow. The authorities, powers, and gifts of these Latter-day Moses and Aaron are complex and will be fully explained in a later series. For our purposes in this series, we will focus on the role of the Rod of God and its gifts. The Rod will be as integral to the Latter-day Redemption of Zion as it was to the liberation of the Israelites from bondage. Joseph of Egypt prophesied that the power given to Moses would come from a rod. In his revelation to Oliver Cowdery, Section 8, the Lord gave a detailed explanation of how Moses received revelation. The Lord called the process the Spirit of Revelation. The Spirit of Revelation is a gift from God. It was given to Moses and offered to Oliver. It was not, however, a free gift. Oliver was required to seek it out, apply unto it as the Lord put it. Faith, honesty, and belief were also necessary to receive the knowledge available through the gift. There is also a defined process in receiving the Spirit of Revelation. Revelation, like all things, must be done in the Lord's way. Revelation will come to the possessor of the spirit of revelation, Oliver in this case, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Once the Holy Ghost has come upon Oliver, the Lord will tell him in the heart and mind. Latter-day Saints have confused this and other statements of the Lord concerning revelation believing that the telling to the heart and mind is a euphemism for feelings. Elder Boyd K. Packer explained in the October 1991 General Conference that Enos receiving the voice of the Lord in his mind should be understood as a feeling and not the voice itself. Enos, who was struggling in the spirit, said, Behold, the voice of the Lord came into my mind. While the spiritual communication comes into the mind, it comes more as a feeling, an impression, than simply as a thought. Unless you have experienced it, it is very difficult to describe that delicate process. Elder Packer conveniently left out the fact that Enos recorded the words of the Lord which came by the voice of the Lord into his mind. Enos also says that he heard the voice. The revelatory experience of Enos cannot be explained as a feeling, impression, or thought. Enos heard the voice of the Lord in his mind and recorded the words expressed by the voice. When the Lord promises Oliver that he will tell him in his mind and heart, then he will speak to Oliver in words, which Oliver will hear and understand, just as Enos. The gifts of the spirit of revelation bear this interpretation of the process out. Through the process of the Lord telling Oliver things in his heart and mind, Oliver will come to a knowledge of ancient records and languages, will receive guidance like unto Moses, and delivery from his enemies. Feelings cannot render these gifts. The Lord gave Oliver another gift, especially for him, 
which is called the gift of Aaron. It was a gift suited for Oliver as the second elder or assistant president, whose example was Aaron. The Lord's description of the gift of Aaron is curious. Unlike the spirit of revelation given to Moses, Aaron's gift must be a physical object. Whatever the gift is, Oliver can hold it in his hands to perform wonders. God said that the gift is a product of his work. He made it. So what exactly is the Lord describing? Oliver's gift of Aaron had already been given to him at the time the Lord explained how it was to be used. Oliver had already used it, and it had told him many things. There was no need to tell Oliver what the gift was. He knew what it was. Earlier versions of the Revelation clarify the identity of Oliver's second gift. The revelation, now known as Section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants, was first published with different wording of the Lord's statement concerning the gift. Oliver's gift was working with a rod, or a rod of nature. A rod of nature in Oliver's time was a divining rod. Divining rods were quite common at the time and were used for a variety of purposes, one of them being receiving revelation. But the original version of the revelation does not mention either the gift of Aaron or a rod. Oliver's gift was working with the sprout, which was a thing of nature. According to Webster's 1828 Dictionary of English, sprout either referred to the end of a branch or a shoot. It was Sidney Rigdon who changed sprout and thing to rod as the revelation was being prepared for publication in the 1833 Book of Commandments. The original identity of the gift as a rod or branch was later disguised as the gift of Aaron in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. This change, according to the historian D. Michael Quinn, was a self-protective response to Eber Howe's 1834 Mormonism Unveiled. The Lord had warned Oliver in an earlier revelation not to make his gift known except to those of his faith. This warning did not refer to concealing his gift from non-Mormons, but from those who did not have faith in using a rod for divination, whether member or not. Church members during Oliver's time and today struggle with or even reject the possibility of rod divination. Yet the Church rightly acknowledges that, in Oliver's case at a minimum, the practice was effective in receiving revelation and was approved by God. In fact, it was a gift of God. Oliver's rod of nature was a form of charm. 
A charm is a physical object used by a magician known as a charmer to gain a supernatural effect. Oliver's Rod produced several supernatural effects, including revelation, unfolding mysteries, protection from enemies, translation of ancient records, and other unspecified marvelous works. Normally, the Lord condemns charming and divination. Both forms of magic and others were prohibited to ancient Israel. Yet, notwithstanding the Lord's previous prohibitions against charming with amulets, Oliver's charming with the rod of nature was approved by the Lord. Oliver Cowdery was not the first in scripture to use a rod as a magical charm. Jacob used striped rods to influence the conception of Laban's cattle and sheep. with a modern rationalistic mindset, Jacob's magic rods have been hard to take seriously. The church struggles with the story and seeks to denigrate it, or even deny it, as this explanation in the Old Testament student manual demonstrates. church prefers to use modern science as the benchmark for accepting or rejecting the supernatural, then it must categorically reject the story of Jacob's rods. Science, as the church rightly pointed out, does not accept the causal relationship between the patterns on the rods and conception. Yet the story is included in scripture which the church accepts as doctrinal. The church and those who accept the Bible as the word of God cannot summarily dismiss the account simply because it violates the tenets of modern science. If this is the standard, then much of the Bible must be rejected. The miraculous is foundational in the book. Furthermore, the church cannot credibly claim that the text is incomplete or corrupted. Certainly, the current Bible is not perfect. But we know that Joseph Smith reviewed the entirety of Genesis during his work on the so-called inspired translation. While he made several changes to Genesis, he let the story of Jacob in chapter 30 stand as is. Joseph found no error in the text. Moses, at the command of the Lord, used a pole as a magical charm for the purposes of healing. He was commanded to attach a fiery serpent of brass to a pole. Merely looking at the pole would heal those who had been bitten by the serpents infesting the camp. In principle, there is no difference between the pole of Moses and the rods of Jacob. The recipient of the effect of the magic, whether it be an Israelite bitten by a fiery serpent or a lamb or goat of Laban, merely had to look at the rod to receive the expected effect. In the case of the brazen serpent, the afflicted Israelite had to consciously look. 
In the case of Laban's sheep and goats, Jacob placed the rod so that it was before the eyes of the cattle. Science does not admit the possibility of either miracle. The church's position on the story of Moses' serpent pole is favorable, accepting it without reservation. Apparently, the fact that it was the Lord who commanded the raising of the pole and its obvious similitude of the crucifixion removed it from the realm of magic. of Jacob and the serpent pole of Moses were charms, whether or not God approved or his power used. For those who doubt the miraculous or the magical, they must consider the consequences of those who doubted Moses' pole. It was disbelief, specifically in the ability of the pole to supernaturally heal, that led to death. Those with hard hearts simply would not look. By the time that Hezekiah had ascended to the throne of Judah, the brass serpent of Moses had become a cultic object. Israel had lost the magical connection to the original purpose of the serpent, and it was now worshipped as other idols. Charms, amulets, and talismans do not have magic power in of themselves. Their power comes from the supernatural agency behind them. The Lord promised two primary magical gifts when Oliver worked the sprout or the rod. Knowledge, including the mysteries of God, and the ability to translate ancient records. The use of the divining rod for gaining information is widespread and of ancient date. Considered a gift from God, dowsers or rodsmen ask the rod to answer specific questions. The questions are posed in a yes or no format with a movement or lack of movement by the rod providing the answer. A traditional Jewish prayer describes this form of rod divination. Heber C. Kimball was a rodsman, often using a rod to answer his important questions. He recorded in his diary in June 1844 one instance where he inquired of the rod while clothed in the robes of the holy priesthood. While historian Richard L. Anderson believed that Kimball's entry described more than yes-no questions, Historian D. Michael Quinn suggested that he followed the standard format for revelation by the rod. We know that Oliver was successful in receiving knowledge through working the rod since it had told him many things. However, we don't know how the revelatory process worked. It is possible that Oliver asked yes or no questions as a normal rodsman would, but the Lord's promise to tell Oliver whatsoever he would ask is problematic. By that means is never explained. Certainly, many things can be learned by the simple yes-no format, but what about the mysteries of God? 
How does one come to know the mysteries of God with a simple binary methodology? How does one ask questions about things one does not know about? And how does the Lord explain the mysteries merely through the movement or lack of movement by a rod? Surely, by that means must be more complex than yes or no questions. There are several plausible explanations of the process of working the rod and receiving complex sets of knowledge. One possible means is the changeable writing of the Liahona's pointers. It was through changeable writing that the Lord gave understanding of his ways, meaning understanding of the mysteries. It would be easy for the Lord to provide writings on Oliver's rod as he did with the pointers on the Liahona. The difference would be that the writing would appear at Oliver's request in faith. Or the Lord could have told Oliver verbally through the rod. The primary meaning of tell, after all, is to communicate by speech. In this case, the rod might operate as a transducer, converting energy into sound. This form of rod divination is claimed in Scripture. Unfortunately, without further clarification, we can't know how the rod worked. All we do know is that whatever the means was, it was unique and supernatural since only the power of God was capable of making the rod work. The second magic gift promised to Oliver when working the rod was the ability to translate ancient records. Oliver did ask and began to translate, but ultimately failed. The Lord told Oliver that he did not understand the process of translation through the rod. The Lord's rebuke and explanation of the process is found in section 9 of the Doctrine and Covenants, perhaps the most misunderstood and misused revelation in the book. The Church has long used Section 9 as the basis of the process for receiving personal revelation, specifically verses 7 through 9. The Church has changed this process of translation into a process where members study out a question or issue and ask if it is right or not. A yes answer is given as a burning of the bosom, while a no answer is a stupor of thought. Perhaps Oliver Cowdery's experiences were recorded for us to understand how to pray and how to recognize answer to prayer. Like many of us, Oliver did not recognize the evidence of answers to prayers already given by the Lord. To open his and our eyes, this revelation was given through Joseph Smith. The Lord provides further insight by counseling us to study a problem out in our mind and then to ask if it be right. If it is right, I will cause that your bosom will burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. But if it not be right, you shall have no such feelings, but you shall have a stupor of thought. Understandably, many members have diligently used this process but have failed to feel the promised burning of the bosom. To resolve this dilemma, the brethren have redefined burning, a physical sensation, into a feeling.
To one who thought that revelation would flow without effort, the Lord said, You have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it were to ask me. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. This burning in the bosom is not purely a physical sensation. It is more like a warm light shining within your being, describing the promptings from the Holy Ghost to one who has not had them is very difficult. Such promptings are personal and strictly private. The Holy Ghost speaks with a voice that you feel more than you hear. For Elder Oaks, the burning in the bosom was a feeling of comfort or serenity, while for Elder Packer, it was a feeling of warmth or light. But these feelings are not the same. These contradictory statements raise questions. Which feelings constitute the burning of the bosom? Are the feelings personalized? Are there other feelings that constitute the burning in the bosom? Elder Packer's self-professed inability to explain what the feeling is like to those who haven't yet received it highlights the problem. If neither he nor others who claim to have felt the promptings of the Holy Ghost and the burning in the bosom can explain the sensation, then how are others to know? Moreover, why would the Lord give an answer in a form which cannot be explained? Wouldn't it be more reasonable to give answers that are unmistakable and therefore easily explainable? Isn't the Lord's explanation, after all, direct and clear? As it did with burning in the bosom, the church has wholly redefined the Lord's no answer, the stupor of thought. The stupor of thought is a suspension of the ability to think and remember. It is a state that prevents the translator to continue. It is not merely an absence of a burning in the bosom. The brethren have replaced the stupor with feelings or an absence of the burning. When we pray for direction, remember the counsel of the Lord given to Oliver Cowdery in the ninth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Study your problems out in your own mind. Make a decision, and then ask the Lord if your decision is right. If so, you will receive a burning of your bosom, or a good feeling. If not, you will receive a stupor of thought, or a questionable feeling. This guidance about prayer given to Oliver Cowdery can also aid you. Behold, you suppose that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it was to ask me. You must study it out in your mind, then ask me if it be right. If it is right, your bosom shall burn, therefore you shall feel that is right. Then the answer comes as a feeling with an accompanying conviction. Then the Lord clarifies, but if it not be right, you shall have a stupor of thought. That for me is an unsettling, discomforting feeling. But a stupor of thought is not a feeling. It is a disruption of the mental process. There are several important points that are being missed or ignored with the explanations of Section 9 by the Brethren. 
The first and most important is the fact the process explained in the Revelation is inspired translation by working the rod. The very next verse, after the Lord's explanation of right and wrong answers, emphasizes the context. It is not that Oliver didn't understand how to receive personal revelation, it is that he did not understand how to translate with the rod. In fact, we know that he understood receiving revelation by working with the rod, since he had already successfully used the rod for such a purpose. Apparently, there are different processes for each form of revelation. Oliver understood one, but not the other. The Church has offered no basis for extending the Lord's explanation of translation by working the rod to receiving personal revelation. The Lord has never claimed or promised that this process could extend beyond translation. Section 9 of the Doctrine and Covenants is about the translation of ancient texts by working the gift of Aaron and has nothing to do with receiving personal revelation. The Lord devised a process for inspired translation that was foolproof and did not allow for false translations. The answer for yes was an unmistakable sensation burning, not a vague and indescribable feeling. The answer for no was a stupor of thought, which rendered the translator incapable of continuing. Thus, only the sacred could be written, and only the Lord could be the source. When the Lord explained to Oliver that he was to study it out in his mind, the it was not a personal question that needed answering, but the text of an ancient record and a proposed translation. Translation, even with a device like a divining rod or a seer stone, still requires mental labor. The process of translation explained by the Lord far exceeded the use of a simple fork divining rod which furnished only yes or no answers. In spite of the Church's view that Oliver's rod was a common divining rod, it must have been something far different and far superior. The revelation of Section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants made it clear that this rod of nature was a gift of God. This means that Oliver did not make it himself or that he received it from someone else, as some believe. He received it from God himself. If the rod of nature given to Oliver Cowdery was not a normal dowsing rod crafted by Oliver or some other man, but a gift from God, then what exactly did God give to him? To answer this question, we must understand the full context of the gift. Lost in the discussion as to the identity or character of the rod, is the important fact that Oliver Cowdery was the second elder of the church. As second elder, Oliver was expected to fulfill the role that Aaron played during the Exodus. Oliver was expected to be the Aaron of our dispensation. The only way for Oliver to act as Aaron was to have the same authorities and powers that the original Aaron had, including the Rod of God. To accomplish the marvelous works promised to Oliver, the miraculous rod of God used by Aaron was necessary. The euphemistic name for the rod of nature, the gift of Aaron, served both to hide the identity of the rod from critics, but also revealed the identity of the gift to those that believed. The gift of Aaron is the gift given to Aaron, which was the rod. It has always been understood in Jewish lore that the rod would reappear in the latter days. Sidney Rigdon was also given the role of spokesman to Joseph Smith. In his role as spokesman, the Lord promised him great power in expounding scripture.
This promise was given in October of 1833. Later that year, in December, Sidney received his patriarchal blessing. The patriarch, Joseph Smith Sr., promised Sidney that he would be a spokesman and in that role would hold the rod of Aaron in his right hand. The blessing was given four years after the gift of Aaron was given to Oliver Cowdery in secrecy. It appears that the gift of Aaron, Aaron's rod, was now well known, or that secrecy was no longer necessary. The Lord gave the identity of the rod in his revelation to Oliver. In the original version, the rod was called the sprout. Sprout has several meanings and is a valid designation for a divining rod. Sprouts, also called shoots or new growths on trees, are commonly used for making divining rods. It was a forked witch hazel that Joseph Smith used during his search for treasure during his early years. This according to Christopher Stafford, who knew the family well. But sprout has another meaning. It also refers to a plant that has put forth new buds or shoots. This could easily be a purposely veiled reference to Aaron's rod which famously brought forth almond buds, blossoms, and almonds. Like the rest of the Davidic regalia, the rod of God would have been stored in the cave of Camorra and available to give to Oliver after his designation as second elder. The fact that the rod of God was given to both Aaron and Oliver Cowdery allows us to make a complete inventory of its powers. We can add the rod's powers mentioned in both the biblical account and the modern revelation. We have documented the following supernatural powers. Last gift, the power to find water, otherwise known as dowsing, is one of the primary purposes of a rod. Forked rods are called dowsing rods for a reason. We do not know if Oliver or Aaron used the rod of God for this purpose, but we know that Moses did. We noted earlier in this series that the Adamic language, the tongue of angels, possessed psychological power. It had the ability to affect the mind of man to the point of overpowering. This was the case of the brother of Jared, whose writings overpowered anyone who read them. The Word of God also has psychological power beyond the words of man, a power to convince man of the truth. The scriptures contain numerous examples of the unique convincing power of the words of God. 
The brothers Nephi and Lehi were given power and authority in preaching and told specific words to use. Their preaching astonished the Lamanites and then convinced them, with 8,000 baptized unto repentance. Helaman and his brethren also declared the word of God in power. Their words convinced many people and induced them to repent and then be baptized. The three Nephite apostles who were translated were given a special convincing power for their ministry amongst the scattered tribes of Israel and the nations of the world. The written word of God carries with it the same power to convince as does the spoken word. Nephi saw in vision other books which would come forth in the latter days. These books were given the power of the Lamb unto the convincing of the Gentiles and Jews. The Book of Mormon is one of those books with the convincing power of the Word of God. Convincing someone to change a belief or to act upon a new course of action can involve effective argumentation and reasoning. This is one of the primary meanings of convince. Paul, who used the power of logical persuasion throughout his epistles, recommended that a bishop be able to exhort through sound doctrine and thereby convince those opposed to the gospel. The Lord counseled Hiram Smith to first learn the word before declaring it. Even the word of God does not have the power to convince if it can't be first articulated. But to convince can also have an element of causation where the ability to convince is more than argumentation. Even after counseling Hiram to first learn the word, the Lord promised the Spirit which would give him a convincing power above and beyond his argumentation. Joseph of Egypt prophesied that a future seer, whom we know to be Joseph Smith, would be given power to bring forth the word of God, but also the power to convince the seed of Israel. In other words, there is a specific power given of the Spirit that prompts the acceptance of new beliefs and behaviors. This power to convince through the Word is likely due to the Word's effect upon the mind. Alma suggested as much when he decided to preach the Word to the Zoramites. According to Alma, the Word of God causes a powerful psychological effect on the human mind. The effect is likely physiological as well. In modern terminology, it appears that the Word of God, especially spoken in the tongue of angels, creates what is called a state of suggestibility. Hypnotists, for example, create a state of suggestibility in their subjects, which then allows them to make suggestions for them to act upon. If the Word of God truly has the power to convince, then it likely creates a state of suggestibility in those hearing or reading it. 